Right. All right. Welcome to uh, March 2024, our uh, skip meeting. Really excited to see some new faces and also some faces that we haven't seen in a while. So this is really, really great. I'm really particularly excited about today's uh, session. I hope we have uh, a good amount of people to join because the topic is really, I think, pretty fun. We've got uh, Joy Gore here. To, she's going to talk about some of her reflections from the, um, <laughs> look at her go, the, her reflections uh, from the Amy Edmondson uh, talk that was given a few weeks back here at Stanford and and then Amy's book. Uh, it was effectively her, her new book on uh, learning from failure. And so we thought it would be really interesting to have a conversation about that. And then also, what do we do with it? We've actually, within the improvement team here at Stanford, we've talked about um, creating almost a, um, what would we call it? Like a, a, a failure fair almost, <laughs> you know, like we learn from some of our spectacular failures uh, because we have so much to learn from the failures and people often bury them. They don't even share them. They just almost pretend that they didn't exist. And, and it's really a shame because I think that uh, there's so much to learn from from those failures. Um, and really, effectively, you're only failing if you're not learning from it, I think. So um, that's that's something I try to live by. Uh, we have lots of opportunities, certainly, here. So um, let me run down the agenda for today, and then we'll, um, we'll get right into it and allow Joy to start sharing. But we'll have Joy talk, and then we'll have a bit of reflection uh, Q&A after that. And then we'll dive right into some breakout teams where we'll actually get, we have some questions that we'd, we'll have the teams discuss. And as always, we will um, spend some of that time getting to know each other and, um, you know, talking about how things are going, where you work, you know, introducing yourself for those who don't know each other, uh, seeing what's going on in people's lives, what you're working on. This gives us all an opportunity to make this large organization and actually a large community. It's not just within Stanford anymore. We're branching out to this community includes people who have taken our courses, people who have um, been affiliated with Stanford some way, somehow, but don't necessarily work at Stanford any, any longer So, or have ever worked at Stanford. So we have a a blossoming community here, and we really want this to be an opportunity to connect with each other. So we've got that, and then following that, we'll come back and we'll do a bit of a debrief to hear what everyone, you know, reflections of people who want to share. So be prepared to share on that. And then um, following that, we will, as we always do, if you've been part of this group, we, we always finish with an exercise we call, I like, I wish, I wonder, which is our, our way of getting feedback. It's our way of understanding what resonated with you, what things you like, what things you'd like more of. And, um, and then that way we're able to build our, our future meetings based on the feedback we receive from this. So any questions, thoughts, comments before I hand it over to Joy? I saw one head nod or shake, so that was good. Okay, all right, good, and another. All right, Joy, you're up. Okay, give me just a second to get pictures back up and chat. I am not great at catching chat, so if anybody chats anything, like just interrupt me instead. <laughs> okay, so uh, we're here in Silicon Valley. We hear fail fast, fail often, all the time, but that's really hard to do. How many of you have either gotten in trouble or seen a colleague get in trouble for failing and then uh, and then the team is now less likely to speak up and help? Yeah, like we say fail fast, fail often, but <laughs> it is really hard to do. Uh, Amy Edmondson, she coined the term psychological safety. She has a, this new book, uh, Right Kind of Wrong, The Science of Failing Well, uh, where she talks about uh, how to think about failing, that there are right and wrong ways to fail. And she had a talk through the Stanford VM Women's, VMware Women's Leadership Innovation Lab a few months ago. Uh, and so, as Ryan said, we wanted to bring this to this group so that we can all think about how we can help build that culture 
of safety, of promoting that right kind of wrong, psychological safety. I uh, wanted to share a few of the concepts from her book. And then as Ryan said, we'll break out into breakout groups to discuss them. So we learn when we're young that failure is bad, that uh, you there are right ways to do things and wrong ways to do things. And, um, and we are also told that if you work hard, you will succeed. And if you are lazy, you will fail. And if you look at those, these top two, that's often true, but the world is complex. And sometimes you work really hard and you still fail or you barely do anything and it works. So the, the, the link between effort and success is not guaranteed. Mm -hmm. and, and so what Amy Edmondson says is we need to change that mental model. It's not about effort to success but it is about types of failure. She says there are three types of failure. The first, uh, the, there are productive and unproductive types of failure that we need to be able to distinguish between them to be able to help us be more comfortable with being able to fail fast, fail often. So this first type is our, our basic failures. There's a single cause and a known process. It's human error, something like you have um, uh, give a wrong med. So it like you, read it wrong and and there was nothing in place. It was one simple failure. Uh, you probably don't want to fail fast, fail often with wrong meds. Yeah. <laughs> the second are complex failures. This is multi-causal, multiple factors uh, together causing a failure. So we talk about Swiss cheese in healthcare all the time. We have multiple people making a series of mistakes in a known process. So uh, what's an example of this? Dom, in interventional platform, <laughs> what do you see? What's an example of a complex failure? Specimens. Specimens, that's a really good one. <laughs> we have, we lose a specimen. Well, we know what the process is supposed to be, but for some reason it still gets lost. It's not because one person made a mistake. There's a number of things that happened and that didn't catch it. The third are intelligent failures. Here, we want to learn something that you don't know using known information to make good guesses. And what we wanna do is like, here's where we want to fail fast, fail often. We wanna increase these and hesitancy slows our learning. Uh, she talks about errors and mistakes being deviations from known protocols. And so it's the, the first and the second are errors, they're mistakes. The third she calls failures. Failures are caused by, uh, caused by, uh, causes by hypotheses that were not supported. We had a hypothesis, we wanted to test it, and it didn't work, we failed. Great. This is experimentation. So she likes talking about trial and fair, uh, trial and failure instead of trial and error. And since we dig into intelligent failure, she says there are four and a half attributes of intelligent failure. The first is that it takes place in new territory. You don't know the answer yet. The second is that there's a credible opportunity to advance towards a desired goal. That if you test it, you can learn something. The third is that there, it's informed by available knowledge that it's hypothesis driven. You aren't just randomly taking something from the air and ignoring all of this other information that you could be using. And the fourth is that the failure is no larger than needed to gain the new knowledge. So she gave an example of this baby bell in the early 2000s. She, she called it Telco. And they are an excellent provider. They provide really, really good customer service. And uh, it's in the early 2000s, they're debating whether to launch this new technology in a major metropolitan area. They, they had a successful, well-staffed pilot in a suburb. It worked great. So they said, let's do it. Let's go for this full-scale launch. And what happened? It was a colossal failure. Their service ratings were normally in the 90s and it was 
after this was in the low teens, majority of the of the calls that they were getting were on this technology. And so would you say that this is an intelligent failure or would you say that this is an error that could have been avoided? What do you think? Probably an intelligent failure. Why do you think that? Thank you, Britt. Because they followed these four things, right? They It was a new place. Like a new place. Um, they had credible opportunity to advance towards right. a goal. Mm -hmm. They had the knowledge that it was working in one place. Mm -hmm. So it's hypothesis driven. Well, the failure is no larger than needed to gain the new knowledge. So um, depends on how you look at it. Yeah, someone said mix of both, but it's leaning yeah. towards intelligent failure. Tamari, can you speak up? Why do you think it's a mix of both? Um, just from my experience, when something is new, um, like there's a lot of unknowns that you just can't... Um, consider and like you just don't know about so like there is that kind of testing the waters and like finding out like what what happened or like what can happen and testing like on the small scale first before you build it out um, yeah. even though you have, have some pilot. they tested yes um but there's still okay. some some things that may go wrong that you just can't consider in your tests your testing. Yeah, you're right. And and I don't know if you caught it, it was a well-staffed pilot in a suburb. And it, so it was a different environment. It was well-staffed. Uh, and so um, Amy Edmondson says, no, this is not an intelligent failure. They, they uh, it was way bigger than it needed to be. So this fourth piece did not, this fourth criteria was not met. Um, and as Tamari, as you said, there were other questions that they didn't answer. They had this well-staffed pilot in a suburb. There were still questions to answer before going and making this huge rollout. Uh, and she said that breakdowns happen because of complex interactions between customers and technologies and the operating systems of Telco, uh, and that it was preventable because it was too big. Uh, so this was a complex failure, not an uh, not an intelligent failure. And so, what could they have done differently? Now knowing that this was a pilot in a, a it was a well staffed pilot in a like as easy a pilot as they could make it. Testing in different populations. Yeah, absolutely. They could have tested different populations. What she says is the, the pilot, even though the pilot was successful, it was actually an unsuccessful pilot because it didn't test the variables that they needed to test. And she has a few questions that she asks to be able to say, was this really a good pilot? So the first is, is the pilot being tested under typical circumstances? So is this a well-funded pilot in a suburb a typical circumstance? Probably not. There's probably a lot of areas that are not going to be well-funded and are going to have different variables. Two, is the goal of the pilot to learn as much as possible? Kind of seems like they staffed it as much as they could, and maybe their goal was to succeed and not necessarily to learn, so maybe not. Uh, the third is, is it clear that compensation and performance reviews are not based on a successful out outcome of the pilot? We don't know anything about compensation and performance for this particular example, but I can definitely imagine uh, a, 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 us like within SHC having some sort of pilot that the, the leadership team is has some sort of incentive to be able to meet it. And so therefore you're more likely to get a positive outcome. Uh, and the fourth is were explicit changes made as a result of the pilot. And it could be, I'll just give you one more. It could be that there's parts in the pilot that um, they didn't really understand well. So, for example, if they scale out from a 
suburban to a sort of metropolitan area, yeah. you know, scalability may be something that they didn't even test, right? And it may be that there's structural, you know, uh, deficiencies in what they rolled it out based on those things, right? Yeah. And so they didn't test for them, they didn't consider them. And right. if they had a well-staffed team that was fixing things in the pilot, so they thought it was stable, right? The stability is different than than uh, rolling it out to a large population. Absolutely. And there were still things that they needed to learn. This fourth criteria was absolutely not met. Uh, and then um, Amy Edmondson says the bonus is make sure that your failure failures lessons are identified, shared, and used going forward. This is so hard to do. And it goes to Ryan's point at the beginning of like having these failure labs. Like how do we learn from each other so we can learn from our lessons or learn from our failures? She also talked about hesitating. She, she, she talked about this, uh, this study that, that she and others ran where you have this mat down in, in this picture, you see this mat. And if you step on it, then the whole thing goes, Aah! if you step on the wrong squares. Now you can't see when you like, as, as the users, you can't see which are the right squares and which are the wrong squares. So you need to learn. And you can see on the left, all these X's are the squares that make the yucky noises. And this path is the path that you use the one and only path that you use to be able to get to the end. The goal is to get from the beginning to the end as quickly as possible. So they have a certain number of minutes to be able to make it to the end. Every time you like get the, the little X alarm on it, you have to start back at the beginning. So that means that every time you make a mistake, you learn something and you can see all these people pointing fingers. So each person's responsible for one or two squares for them to say, Yes, this one or no, not that one. And they can they can help this this girl who's here uh, step on the right boxes. But you can see that she's hesitating. She's not actually making this next step. She didn't want to make a mistake. So is this a reasonable time to hesitate? What do you think? Does it make sense for her to sit there and go, oh, do I step on this one or do I not? Is it going to beep? I'm seeing Mo shake his head no. Why not, Mo? Because there is no consequences. She's just going to repeat the whole thing and learn something. There's no consequences. They'll learn and there's no consequences. Exactly. So, well, so there in in the exercise there there is a like a it's a it's it, there's like a dollar amount that you lose for choosing wrong, but like there's also a speed penalty. It's like this really complicated thing, but if you make it through, you actually win. <laughs> but the the idea is that the faster you do it, the the um, you know there there's more of a penalty of sitting there and not moving than learning. You know, getting the little penalty of the cost that they had in the exercise. I got to do it once, and it was really pretty interesting because it's people do they freak out, and it's like oh, I got to get it perfect. And you don't know, it's like, you have no idea which ones are going to be <laughs> until you try, you know, it's silly, but we do that. So that's just with stepping on a box, but, you know, how often do we do that with, with tests, you know, wanting to make it perfect before we even test something. It's, it's really interesting. Yeah. yeah. It's great. Fascinating. And so she has this framework for us to be able to help think through when should we hesitate? When should we not? And experimenting that this, this game on the previous slide is, is over here at the very bottom right. It's novel context. There is information that you don't know that you will learn from, and it's low stakes. So have fun experimenting. Do fail fast, fail often, and learn. Uh, very often we have these novel contexts, but there are higher stakes. At that point, you still want to experiment, but you need to figure out your environment and be more careful about how it is that you experiment so that you don't cause something uh, that you don't want to cause. Like, for example, let's say we have 
a cancer research drug. You're not just going to take that and all of a sudden throw it out to a whole bunch of people. You go through a lot of steps to be able to, to test and see how well that drug is going to work. Uh, you start with bench tests and then you go to animal studies and then you go to small uh, clinical studies with very unsafety just for very few people. And then you build up from there. As you move this way, as you move left um, into, as you have consistent contexts, then um, you either keep doing as you normally do, your business as usual, or if it's high stakes, it's still, it's still doing your standard processes and being very careful to make sure that you're executing mindfully. Any questions or thoughts on this one? So um, as, as, as Amy framed the, uh, these three types of failure, you have your first type of failure, your simple failure, where what you want to do is you want to minimize your basic failures. You want to anticipate and mitigate your complex failures. You don't want these kinds. The third kind uh, with our intelligent failure, you do want to promote and celebrate that. And she talks about how you need psychological safety. You need to have awareness of an error to be able to make sure that you're minimizing the ones that you don't want and that you are maximizing what you do. You need to be able to catch and correct these errors. Uh, and that needs psychological safety to make it easier for people to speak up, to take smart risks, and to shut down failing initiatives. Because you don't want to keep doing something that isn't going, that, that you know isn't going to work. So she talks about psychological safety. She defines it as a belief that the context is safe for interpersonal risks, that speaking up with ideas, questions, concerns, or failures will be welcomed and valued. Very often we think about psychological safety as, uh, and, and about it being nice and comfortable, but psychological safety is not about being nice and comfortable. Very, uh, like if you are over in this area where the performance standards are not being changed, then sure, you can be comfortable. You can feel psychologically safe and just be comfortable. But if you are trying to make changes, which all of us with an improvement are always trying to make changes, you're trying to improve the standard or reach, re, reach a standard or improve a standard. And as you're doing that, you need psychological safety for people to be in a learning zone in order to improve. If there isn't psychological safety, then people start getting anxious. So the question is, how do we help promote psychological safety? Uh, and she has, she says three things. One is make sure you frame the work. Um, I was I was in a talk a couple of weeks ago and, I, and one person raised their hands and we, we were talking about how do you build, how do you build more of a consensus driven uh, team rather than having one leader that says, this is it, this is my way and it's my way or the highway. And, and somebody raised their hand and said, my boss doesn't want us to go towards this consensus building because then they're not going to have the control that they feel they need. And the answer to that was, well, sometimes that's true and sometimes it's not. So you need to frame when you need that control and when it's okay for the whole team to chime in and collaborate and uh, and build together. And so we need to have, have this to frame whatever it is that we're doing to say, this is where we want mutual learning. This is where it's, this is where it's safe. This is where it's not safe. Her second is to invite participation. Uh, she said, be humble and be curious, it's contagious. Uh, she also wants to encourage us speaking up, celebrating failures so that people can learn and change. Uh, she, she said to celebrate the pivot when you learn something that didn't work uh, and then you need to change directions. Focus on the on forward not, uh, and focus on what's happening next so that you can get people moving forward and moving up and, and excited about what's coming next. Uh, I have 
um, a quick example, and then Dom, I see your hand is raised. Um, I was working on um, working with inpatient nursing on trying to like, how do we figure out how to improve the huddle system? And so went to a number of different teams and we started talking about it. And we're saying, we're going to have this pilot and we're going to do something. And after talking to a whole bunch of groups said, you know what, this isn't the time and the place. And so I went back to those original forums that I had talked about. We're going to have a pilot and this is so great and said, you know what, here's what we learned. And here's what's coming up next. And here is the, here's what's valuable. And it was really hard for me to go do that one these forums are so tight and there's, there are so many agenda items. I didn't know if people were going to think that I was a waste of time. And so I wanted to make sure that I was, uh, but it was important for me to do this because it's so hard for us to go back and say, this failed and here's what we learned. So I wanted to, I wanted to be that example. Um, and so that was my whole point. Be the example <laughs> and tell people so that we can all learn from each other. Dom, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Joy. On that note, um, I have I've been struggling with something a little where when a new idea is presented, and it might be in a not a huge group, but like a leadership group where there's several leaders on the call. Um, something at Stanford I've noticed where people, when there's a discussion, because it might be new to the group. Sometimes we default to let's talk about this offline, which means smaller group, not everyone in that meeting will participate mm. for for valid reasons at time because, you know, it'll we've derailed the conversation, kind of taken over the meeting. And I've been also I don't want to say guilty, but I've also used that term like, hey, we need to take this offline. We got to keep moving with the agenda. But now um, I just went to this uh, women's leadership luncheon not too long ago. And I realized like, are we not building either healthy failure culture, but also psychologically safe environment, inclusive environment for the people on that call? Because then we're, we are excluding certain people by saying we're going to take this offline and not everyone is invited to that conversation, even though people may have something to contribute to yeah. the conversation. So like leaning into inquiry, I, I guess, how do we do it in a way where we want to hear your input and we don't want to, when you say like, let's take it offline, it kind of shuns away, it shuts it down. And it almost sets this tone where not everyone is invited to the after party. And, you know, it's, it's, it's going to now be a certain level of leadership where those people will take it offline and and everyone else has to kind of fall into whatever that decision is. And I've just started to notice that when we get into, uh, a, and I don't wanna call it like conflict, but just maybe some, some disagreement, which is sometimes a good thing because you gotta iron it out and get to that best product at the end. It, it gets to let's take it offline. And I, I wanna just see, yeah. what other thoughts are here and how, like me as a leader, how can I maybe say, no, let, let's actually discuss it here a little more because I want people to feel safe to bring up their, their thoughts, but then not have a full blown um, off topic meeting. Yeah, no, that's that a really good question. I think about that, I think about that often. And I had a manager who was a, a, the most incredible facilitator that I've ever, ever seen. Uh, and she very consciously decided whether she was going to let the conversation continue and that we weren't going to get through all the agenda topics or uh, if it was something that needed to be offline. And there's a whole bunch of comments in chat. So who else wants to share? Michelle? Yeah, um, uh, part, of, part of this is that everyone has very formalized agendas and they and they um, use them kind of almost like a weapon to have a one-way conversation as opposed to building in discussion points where there th there might be issues for discussion um and and it's very hard hierarchical you know not everyone's invited to those meetings um and that's why you know when gambas were discussed in, at in honda they wanted to make sure that that the leaders went to the went to the place where the work is being done, uh, so that they bypassed all the layers of of management 
that stifled the conversation because um, everything had, a, you know, they didn't want any surprises in meetings. Yeah. And, and the, everything was taken offline because there's no room for it in the agenda. And it was, it came out spontaneously and was not planned in advance. And it takes some trust for, um, for meetings to open up and have that, that discussion about exploration. Let's explore this more or, or if it can't be done, that means let's let's explore this more, not just taking it offline, but let's explore this more and report back to this group. Jakaria. Yeah, thank you, um, Dom and Michelle. Just to piggyback off or what Michelle was saying, I wonder if we add a sentence to that. Let's take it offline. And if anyone is interested in joining the discussion, just ping me so I can make sure you're included. Um, because... I know for me, I run tight meetings. Sometimes I only have 30 minutes with eight leaders and I have to get my decisions because I don't get them back in a room for two months and stuff has to happen. So it's not an exclusionary sort of move for me, although we all know people have different preferences for their power moves and maybe for some that's a tactic. For me, it's out of necessity, but if we could just open up the opportunity for people to participate so they know it's not an exclusionary tactic, um, that may be an option as well. Great thought. Okay, so the third point that she said is respond pro uh, productively. Uh, she talked about accountability and how accountability is often synonymous with punishment. But accountability is not, that's not what it's actually, how it's, how it's actually defined. It should be about being responsible for one's actions. So when we think about right, and we have our right teams and we have our, our uh, project progress scale, it's how do you help the team stay on track so that they can then hold themselves accountable to that right timeline so that we can make sure that everybody has results and can graduate. Um, making sure that we're destigmatizing failure and we're, we're celebrating those, uh, celebrating failure. So those are the thoughts that I wanted to share. And what we have next are discussion questions. And so Ryan, did we did you say you wanted to open this up for broad discussion first before we go into breakouts or just go straight into breakouts? No, I was just thinking we if there were any particular questions or clarif clarifications that people had, we might ask those before we jump into the, the breakouts. And I'm not seeing any. Um, Okay. Okay, so so here's what we're going to do in this next section. So there's these questions here. I've actually put them in a mural. So all of you, m most of you are familiar with how we do this. We often will break, will break out and each of you will be in a particular room and that's gonna be your team number. And so when you go into the mural, you'll have a, a section and we would like for you to use that section to take notes on, you know, some of the, the ideas and concepts that your team were discussing, because when we come back, we'd love to be able to uh, have a bit of a debrief. And so what we try to do also in these, um, well, we do two other things as well in, in all of these sessions. Uh, one is networking. So we like to have everyone start, don't just jump into the questions and go to business. Um, the, the first thing we'd really like you to do is, is introduce yourselves, check in, um, maybe ask each other a, a, a icebreaker question um, for a few minutes. The other thing we do is we try to teach methods and practice things that you can use in your improvement practices. So that's why we do things like using mural and documenting and debrief and all these and, and the idea of the immediate feedback using I like, I wish, I wonder, because these are tools that if we get familiar with them, then we start using them more and, and you start, you get more tools in your tool belt. And so if you're familiar with them, then you can try them. Uh, and then um, as we learn new things, we're constantly trying to introduce new, new concepts and then just model them as we do this. So anyway, that was just a behind the scenes look into what, what we do and why we do it. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and I'll put in um, in the chat, I will, there's the, the link for 
Miro, and I'm going to open the rooms. When I do, uh, first click on the link for the mural, and then I'm going to open the rooms. Go ahead and, and jump in the rooms and get started. But remember, first thing is introduce each other. Um, I'm going to join a room once I see everyone else. So, so here we go. And uh, 15 minutes. We'll do 15 minutes. All right, welcome back. I, I know that was, for some, that was way too short. I was mid-sentence, I know, <laughs> Talk, talking about something. Um, we could talk about this for a long time. We might actually, as a result, um, let's see how the feedback goes, but we, we may bring this one back because I think there's a lot of energy around it and a lot we can learn. And like I mentioned before, I think we can, um, we, I, I really love the idea of, of creating some kind of a venue where we can celebrate the values that we've learned from, you know, those, those experimentations, those, those areas that um, really have, have, can foster more learning um, and, and how we might do that. So, so keep, uh, keep an eye out for that. What I would like right now is actually stay, you all still have that mural, hopefully it's still up at the bottom is three sections. I like, I wish, and I wonder. What we'd like for you to do now in the next few minutes, we don't have time for the debrief, that's that's fine. You, you still have the link, you can look at all the people's notes um, to review those, but if you would, just take a few minutes with whatever time you have left with, between now and your next meeting, or you can do it later today, and go in there and, and just do some little sticky notes on things that you liked about this meeting, the concept, the topic, the presentation, the way we structured it, whatever, um, things you, you, you wish maybe would have been different or maybe we would have talked about. And then the wonder is like, I wonder if we could do, I mean, it could be anything, uh, a new topic next time, a, uh, a way that we structure things, if an event in the future, uh, getting more people involved, anything. So if you would just take a few minutes to do that, we would really appreciate it because uh, it, it truly, truly does um, help us to inform us on, on how to get better. So thank you all very much. And um, if you need to drop off, you need to get to another meeting, feel free to do that. And um, I'm going to hang around for a few minutes. Um, if there's any questions, I'm going to stop the record oh, recording. And I I also threw in just before we went into break um, a YouTube link. So this is this is the the talk that I just shared uh, with Amy and Vincent actually talking. Um, it is for anyone in Stanford Medicine, and it, but it's an open link to anybody. But please don't share it outside of Stanford Medicine. Thank you, Thank Joy. You, Joy. Yeah, we did get her permission to do that. So yeah, thanks for doing that. 